is an unspoiled network podcast. This is Spoil Me, covering Gravity Falls, Season 1, Episodes 15 and 16, The Deep End and Carpet Diem. In these episodes, I think The Deep End might be my favorite episode of this series so far. I cackled from start to finish. And granted, I was stoned, but I don't think that's all it was. Welcome to Spoil Me. Welcome to the show, everybody. I am Natasha. Thank you very, very much to Melanie for commissioning these episodes. Melanie is in the chat right now and waved at me. Yeah, these episodes. So first of all, I am a big, big fan of any sort of like unexpected twist on a character that I think I know what he's going to be like. So I think that's part of why Deep End got to me so bad was that the like dude who runs the pool was not what I thought I was going to get and is just so insane in in such a uh, a series of ramped up moments with him that get progressively more and more ludicrous and hilarious that that as a backdrop really, really worked for me. Um, Also, I do want to mention that I had said last episode how annoying it was that all of this, uh, these episodes were like super expensive and only available on Prime now. Well, Disney Plus has them all. So if you are somebody who has Verizon, you can go to an unlimited plan and get a year of Disney Plus for free, which is what I did. Um, So yay, no longer having to pay two bucks an episode, only had to do that one time. So this episode, y'all is so like, it's so full of awesomeness. And uh, Melanie is saying in the chat, Mabel crush episodes are always a delight. And yes, I, I don't feel like I've given enough credit to the writers with the fact that uh, they have sort of reversed things here. Um, And I, when I say reverse things, I don't really want to lock myself into being like everything gears towards kids goes this one way, but I think you guys are going to recognize what I'm talking about when I start to say, but Mabel getting to be just a boy, crazy young girl who is just into dudes and always like, especially the, the episode following carpet DM with her and her friends, like, it's really nice to see that being treated like it's totally normal and a thing. And her just jumping head first into her crushes and not having any sort of like self-consciousness about it is great. And oftentimes when there's like a boy and a girl character, I don't know how much of this is a conscious thing. But there will frequently be, I don't like to say excuses made, but they'll be, they will let the boy be interested in like every girl that crosses his path. Meanwhile, the girl character will often have a crush on one particular boy. And I think that this is an episode uh, or um, an episode. I think that this is a symptom of sort of respectability politics and we can't have a girl being promiscuous and being interested in every boy. She can have an interest in one boy and very particularly be aware of him. Now the boy character just likes girls because that's how boys are. Am I right? And I love that this show has taken that and twisted it around. So it's Dipper that's really into Wendy specifically And then Mabel, who is just into boys, period. And she'll get interested in a particular one occasionally, but it's very clear that 
she just kind of throws whatever at the walls and sees what sticks and then goes with that and isn't very particular about it. So I just really like that. And I, I love the fact that they're really unapologetic with her about it. You know, Dipper sort of will rib her about the fact that she gets a crush so easily, but she feels no shame about it and does not feel like apologizing for it. And it's great. Um, Melanie says, we first saw a cameo of the pool guy in Dipper's voice changer story running after him as part of the prank caller mob. Yes, I had, didn't catch that, but Owen, who was watching this episode with me, did. He was like, oh my God, we saw that guy. He was sitting in the bar when that guy yelled, there's a prank caller, let's get him. And I was like, was he? So yeah, I didn't notice that, but Owen did. Um, so this episode starts off, it's like 110 degrees. Apparently, the shack does not have air conditioning because everybody is sitting inside, like, laying on the ground in their underwear, just fucking trying to make it through the day. And, guys, I don't know how many of y'all have not had uh, air conditioning in your lives, but I, if you have only ever lived places with it, you cannot imagine how awful it is down here in texas it's a lot rarer for you to find a place that doesn't have it um it's just considered a basic fucking necessity but up north in connecticut and philadelphia a lot of places don't have it and you have to get window units and like if it's an older building sometimes you can't even find window units that fit the weirdo windows that this building is like so there are a lot of things that I take for granted living in, in places that are newer and more updated that I forget are terrible. Um, our air conditioning in down here in Texas went out this summer just for like four hours and it was fucking unbearable. It was so, I literally sat outside while he repaired the air conditioning because it was cooler and better outside because there was at least a breeze. And these guys all laying around in their underwear, like as spread out as they can, because that's what you like. If you curl up on yourself, you're just sweating onto yourself. So you spread out to try and allow the sweat to evaporate before it gets too disgusting. And it's just so this this opening image just really got it across. Um so they are all listening to the radio and they re they hear an announcement that the Gravity Falls pool is open. And there's a pretty great moment where the kids have to get a spatula to get Grunkle Stan off the floor because he's stuck to it. And there's – guys, I love this joke. This is the first of many jokes that made me like just cackle. He's got part of the floor still stuck to him when he leaves the house. And you hear the guy on the radio say, also watch out for sudden fires. And you hear Grunkle Stan scream outside and go, wait, what? And then the sound of like flames. So yeah, an unexpected fire broke out on Grunkle Stan's back because of the floor wood. Does it make any sense? No. Do I fucking love it? Yes, it's the best. So this is just the first of many. Um... So we go to the pool and it turns out that Wendy has gotten a part-time gig here as a uh, lifeguard. And I really enjoy – Grunkle Stan is like excited to go to the pool, but he also says something about how nothing like <laughs> – Nothing like sitting in a moist tub with strangers. It's like the bus, but wet. Which, dude, rude. Why do you need to put it that way? Um, and as they're coming up to the pool, Mabel sees this dude who is leaning against the wall of the pool with a float in front of him. And he has a seashell necklace on, a little bit of facial hair, and long flowing hair rippling in the breeze. And she is fucking smitten. Especially when Seuss, like, goes up to her and tells her, oh yeah, it's like this guy never leaves the pool. I've heard that he's a mysterious loner. 
which is, you know, tween speak for girl, you got to get you some of that. And, you know, because this is Gravity Falls, I'm assuming that all of us knew immediately that this dude was a mermaid. Like, it has to be. I don't know how he got there. I don't need to worry about that yet. I just assume mermaid. And sure enough, that turns out to be what it is. Um, yeah. Mabel is just fucking enchanted and immediately goes sprinting over there to talk to him. It's so great. You know, like, so, so many of us could use a lesson from Mabel. We'll see somebody that we like and we just don't know what to do. We just want to sit back and, like, hope that they also notice us, that we get some sort of sign that speaking to them is a good idea. And she doesn't care about any of that. She immediately just sprints and does not try and hide the fact that she's into him. And God bless her. I want to be like her when I grow up. Um, so this is when we find out that Wendy has the, uh, that she is the lifeguard and that she has water balloons, which she starts throwing at Stan and it is great. And she tells him, um, Dipper, who's very excited to see her, uh, the same way that Mabel is, except not as confident. Um, he wants to know, uh, whether or not there is, he said, she, she says that she's doing tryouts for the day because we're new, looking for a new assistant lifeguard. And he's like, Oh, do you think I could do that job? And she says, yeah, you definitely could, but you have to go check with my boss first. Mr. Pool check. And this is the first time that we get a good look at this dude and what he's like. So this dude, guys, it's so great. He is like one of those dudes that's like super, super fit, but also balding. So he's like got this weird combination of like dad and also model it's a weird thing he like drops his uh his oh my god what do you call it when you have a little board that you clip your papers to clipboard <laughs> you see how i manage that guys i am smart um and just immediately goes down into doing a series of increasingly difficult push-ups with like his uh tips of his fingers and hands and everything it is wonderful so when Dipper sees this, he kind of starts to like reconsider that maybe he wants to talk to this dude, but he really likes Wendy. So he goes on ahead with it. Um, and meanwhile, we see Mabel trying to chit chat with this dude who is, we find out named Mermando, which is perfect. Um, and guys, can I just mention again, there are so many things about this episode that I love. One of the things that I love and hate the most is that throughout this particular scene, there is a Band-Aid floating in the water in front of Mabel. Now, it does not need to be there. It's gross. It's kind of awful. I love that they chose to include this. Like, it's just it's so creepy and awful and i the whole thing so she begins to comb his hair and he is very delighted with how forward she is super duper receptive to what she's putting down until she asks him if he wants to go over to the snack bar and then he tells her i'm sorry i can't i have a terrible secret i must go and then he swims away and she says, I'm upset yet intrigued, which is precisely how this is supposed to go. And eventually he reveals to her that he is a merman who like <laughs> through a series of unfortunate events wound up like rolling down a hill into this pool from where he had used to live in the lake. Um, and 
it's just the whole story is so amazing. There's like a point where he's like on the shore and a bunch of animals keep him uh, hydrated by licking him, which is just the weirdest. But yeah, I just love it. So we have Dipper going to talk to Mr. Poolcheck, who has hammered a sign that says do not touch with like 14 nails in it on the pool supplies door. And when Dipper gets his attention, he comes up to him and sniffs him and says, SPF 100, good. I like you. Guys, this is when I knew I loved this character. Like, they're making him sort of a, almost like a survivor man type thing. Like, they're trying to, but it's it's like he, like, is the veteran of a war, but all it is is the pool. It's amazing. Ah, it's so, it doesn't make any sense. I love it so much. So, yeah, he starts to uh, talk about how it's anarchy out there and points to the pool where everybody is very softly floating in total quiet. And then he yanks off his hand. It turns out he has a prosthetic hand and tells Dipper that he lost his hand to a pool filter. Now I'm going to ignore the fact that we see his fingers moving while he does push-ups earlier because that doesn't go together. It's fine. I do not care. But yeah, he says the pool is uh, is cruel and, and you have to respect her rules. Do you think you have what it takes, boy? And Dipper is like, uh, like ready, it seems, to kind of be like, maybe I don't have what it takes. But then he looks over and he sees Wendy waiting for him, tossing a water balloon in one hand. And he's like, oh, God, yep, no, I'm, I'm in. I keep, I have to keep my eyes on the prize here. So he gives Dipper a, <laughs> a whistle, tells him, welcome to the deep end, son. And then gives him way too forceful a hug for way too long. It's just, guys, it just keeps getting better and better and better. And then here comes another wonderful thing we get little Gideon back again. Little Gideon is just like just the perfect character to pop in and out like this. I don't, I don't dislike like episodes that have little Gideon at center stage because he's hilarious and so weird that Yes, totally. He deserves his own episodes. But I love the fact that he also gets peppered in like this because it's unexpected and really like nobody else could get to you the same way that he gets to Stan so that you completely understand where Stan is coming from the way that Gideon does. You know, we don't have a history with other characters except for him of just consistently hating them. So... Stan has found the absolute perfect lawn chair and is very, very excited about its positioning. As he points out, it's facing away from where old man McGuckin lotions himself. It is equidistant between the snack bar and the bathroom. It's got a perfect mix of sun and shade. It's exactly what he wants. And he puts his towel over it that says property of Stan it turns his back for a little bit too long. And as soon as he sits down, there is Gideon already se seated and putting on a sunblock. Oh my, was this your chair? I had no idea. Yes, I did Stan. I knew. My God, you guys, if you could have heard me fucking howl, when he whispered that, I fucking died. I like every time I hear Gideon's voice, it's always newly funny. But the whispering and the taunting of Stan in particular is just so good. I love this so, so, so much. Ugh. And I love how like Stan is just like it's it's clear if anybody was watching 
you know that Gideon stole the spot from him. But unfortunately, Gideon's a child who's tiny and adorable to people who are stupid. So when Stan picks him up to, I believe, literally punt him into the pool, I think was probably his intention. He gets locked up in pool jail by Wendy, I should point out. Um, and he's, of course, yelling and protesting about how you can't do this to an old man. And Wendy says, sorry, Stan, it's not up to me. And then giggles and says, oh, actually, it is. Again, Wendy, you're great. Um, and we get, guys, another pool check moment. And I'm going to tell you about every single one of these as they come up because they're, they get better and better and better. So... Wendy wants to, like, abuse their power, her and uh, Dipper, and invites him to, like, run around and, like, you know, just make trouble. And he expresses some reticence about this because of how Mr. Poolcheck is acting right now. He says he seems kind of uh, emotionally unstable. And we cut to Mr. Poolcheck, who is doing a series of weird sit-ups over the top of the fence. And by that, I mean his knees are draped over the top of the fence so that his body is like folded in half. And he is slowly coming to like a standing position with his feet planted like within the framework, I would guess, of the fence. And then staring around suspiciously and then lowering himself back down again. As he does this, which is, is ridiculous enough, the Foley guys have done something to make it sound like every vertebrae in this man's back is cracking. It's just perfect. It's so perfect. So Wendy tells Dipper, you've just got to be sneaky about your rule breaking. And she tells him, uh, race you to the no running sign. And at this point, Dipper begins to follow her instructions and run. But when he looks up, Mr. Poolcheck is drinking water from the pool. <coughs> Excuse me. Very slowly. Very creepily. And slowly turns his eyes toward Dipper as if he is able to sense what is happening. And Dipper very quickly slows to a walk. Meanwhile, in pool jail, Stan is talking to the other kids who have been put in there. And they're talking to him about how it's not so bad unless you get put in solitary. And then they show this kid who's looking at them through bars of what looks like a sewer. And he just says, it's the nights that are the hardest. And there's a whooshing sound and a bunch of leaves go by. And this turns into a post credit scene later on that is absolutely ridiculous. It doesn't make any sense and is flawless. And I don't care. There are times where something that doesn't make sense really like gets under my skin. This show can do whatever it wants. As far as I am concerned, go nuts. And the recurring joke of this kid being in solitary, another one that just for some reason, it just got to me. I loved it. So we go back to Mabel and Mermando and she brought him a sandwich that is soaking wet and uh, is very excited to tell him. So I brought you a sandwich and I love sharing sandwiches and secrets. Um, and this is when he tells her about everything that happened to him. And he pulls out this guitar and plays a couple of chords. Um, I was swimming with my dolphin friends in the Gulf of Mexico when I was in ensnared. And the dude who catches him is like, oh, my God, we caught a mermaid. And the fucking captain is like, great, let's feast on his flesh. Another moment of me bursting into fucking laughter. Like, 
No, you you're not going to sell tickets to see him as a as a an oddity. You're not going to try and make money off of this. Nope, we're just going to eat him. I Yep, yep. The cargo was headed for Gravity Falls. Using all my strength, I tried to escape back home, but it was not to be. He begins to like swim up a uh, waterfall like a salmon, but he gets hit in the face with a log that knocks him off and he gets beached and then the forest animals come and help keep him hydrated and it's a bunch of uh deer that are like standing around him licking him until he starts giggling and wiggling and he falls down a pipe and winds up in the pool it is absolute nonsense and it's wonderful i the 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 fact that there was some sea captain that was like excited to eat him is just wonderful. So, of course, he's trying to tell Mabel that, like, you must stay away from me. I'm sure that you're very weirded out by this. And Mabel is like, of course I'm not. I want to hang out with you. Let's play Marco Polo. And she squeezes his face to look into his eyes. But that's where his gills are. So he starts to suffocate. <laughs> uh, meanwhile, Grunkle Stan is watching fucking uh Gideon on his chair and is trying to formulate some kind of plan to outwit him so what he winds up doing is coming back in the middle of the night and claiming his chair before the place even opens and which leads to a great moment of him saying, all right, now just have to wait 15 hours until the pool opens again. And there's a long pause before he says, this was a good plan. And it turns out that Gideon covered the entire chair with glue. So he will not be able to get off again, which is the meanest thing. And also hilarious because it leads to another whole thing with a spatula. Um, Gideon, you're too great. I, I the, the what a genius character they have created here. He like tries to get Gideon to move using the reflection from his watch, and it's and Gideon immediately like holds something up. Oh, it's his uh his his sun goggles, and it zaps back into Stan's face, and. Gideon literally says, as he drops these onto his face, deal with it. Like the fucking gif where the pixelated sunglasses fall into somebody's, onto somebody's face. Now for the next joke. And I know I have to speed it up because I'm halfway through my time and I haven't even started talking about the second episode yet. But I need to talk about this one because I think this might be my favorite joke of the series. And I think the reason I feel this way is because it's so similar to a joke that Owen will do here and there. Now I said last episode that I don't love Seuss. Like as a character, he's like a sweetheart, but a lot of his jokes fall kind of flat for me. And I don't know if it's just that they're not written that well or if it's the voice actor's delivery of the jokes being very sort of like predictable. Cause I feel like even if you have a joke that is a joke you could see coming from a mile away, if you have somebody who knows how to deliver a joke really well, it doesn't matter. It'll still be funny. And I feel oftentimes that there are jokes that Seuss gets that he doesn't do as much with as he could. So this is a moment where Seuss is more the butt of the joke rather than the one telling the joke. But he is looking at the floats and there are these floats that are ducks or something, I guess ducks. And he is very excited putting one on. And we hear a voice say, Seuss. And he says, is that you, inflatable duck? Can you talk? Yes, Seuss, I can talk. Oh my gosh, I knew you guys were secretly alive. I knew it. And then we cut and it's uh, Wendy and, and Dipper 
who are using their like mic to talk to him and say, my people have been enslaved, Seuss. You must free us. And Seuss is very here for this. The inflatable pool duck revolution is at hand. So, guys, when Owen... The reason I think this maybe got to me so much, Owen and I love to go, like, window shopping together, and especially at the holidays, um, Halloween and Christmas, and go to, like, shops like TJ Maxx and uh, Home Goods and Tuesday Morning, because you find really weird stuff in these places. You find a lot of cute, great stuff, but there will always be occasionally something that you're just like, whose fucking idea was this? This thing is not seasonal. It's just creepy and terrible. And oftentimes it will be something that incorporates like trying to make an object and an animal go together or something weird like this. And it never fucking never fails to make me laugh. But often Owen will pick one of them up and hold it next to his face and go, kill me, kill me. (laughs) And this just reminded me of that so much. Um, I just like this one I laughed for like several minutes after this whole scene was over so what what winds up happening here is that pool check clears the place out and he tells uh, Dipper to lock up all of the supplies and make sure that nothing gets taken it turns out that shit is getting like meddled with in the middle of the night and Dipper is being held responsible for that and it, you know, there's there's all kinds of people in his family that are involved in this. There's Grunkle Stan who broke in so that he could get his seat. There is Mabel breaking in so that she can see her merman lover. There is Seuss breaking in so that he can free the enslaved ducks. Uh, he, too many people to count. And M- Mabel is explaining to Mermondo how she's going to get him out. And again, again, there's so many good jokes in this episode. Um, She hands him a drawing. My original plan was to tape together a bunch of fish sticks to make you a prosthetic pair of people legs. And... Guys, it's it's a combination of how absurd it is, of her drawing of it, of Mermanda's reaction going intriguing as he looks at it rather than just dismissing it out of hand. It all coalesced to just be like such a great joke. Um, and I really need to get to the end of this. But eventually, Mermando winds up like, starting to dehydrate as they drive him to the lake and rather than just rolling him into the water, which I also expected for them to do, they use reverse CPR in which uh, Dipper puts water in his mouth and like pushes it into Mermondo's mouth. And this allows Mabel to take a photo of him apparently making out with an unconscious merman to use as blackmail for some later point. Um, and yeah, Mermondo sits up and is just like, why didn't you just roll me into the lake? And Dipper's like, God damn it. So they are able to drop him off and he does a little dolphin cry and he is sitting there going, I don't know how my family will ever be able to hear my cries from the depth of the ocean. And Dipper has to try, he tries to take away the uh, megaphone that Mabel is going to give to Mermondo because he'll lose his job. But she convinces him by explaining that She says, haven't you ever loved somebody and you knew that it would never work out, but you'd still do anything for them? And he immediately is like, ah, fuck. You said like the thing and lets her take it and sacrifices his job. And it's very sweet. 
Meanwhile, Mabel's talking about all of the like, p- like cute paranormal dudes that she's met. And she says something about a couple of cute vampires. And Dipper says, I don't remember the vampires. And she just says, I don't tell you everything, which is fantastic. I just want an Adventures of Mabel sideshow. And Mermando kisses her. And she does a little dance on the dock and talks about how that was my first kiss. And then makes fun of Dipper about how it was kind of his first kiss, too. And it's wonderful. It's just, it's wonderful. I love this so much. Um, so it ends with Seuss trying to escape over the fence because he is, uh, stealing the tubes and Mr. Poolcheck chasing him. And it, Wendy also got fired because she was stealing snacks from the snack bar. And it's just a very happy ending. It's great. But, of course, Mabel is a little sad because she had to say goodbye to her Mermando, whom she really likes. And then all of a sudden, here comes a message in a bottle. And it says, Dear Mabel, I am home with my family. I am very happy. Our first kiss will always hold a place in my heart. Technically hearts. As a merman, I have like 17 hearts. Horrifying, but true. And then an asterisk, more bottles on the way. And like seven bottles come popping out of the drain. So it's great. It's just, it's perfection. Guys, this episode is so good. I love this one so much. And uh, then we have, of course, the ending credits with the kid that is stuck in pool solitary. And he is watching the seasons pass and celebrating the 4th of July and watching the fireworks from his watery prison fitting end just so good i love this one so then we go to carpet diem and this is actually a pretty touching one even though it's so weird so it starts off with um mabel and dipper playing in their room and they are doing this like weird sort of mini golf setup that they have created using these eyeball things for uh, golf balls. And they're having a pretty good time together. And she says something about how her friends are coming over and he gets agitated about this. And when the girls like crash open the door And yell that they're having a sleepover. He immediately freaks out. And is just really not here for this. Now, it's understandable when you watch, like, the way it is to share a room with all of them. That this would be super, super irritating if you were not also involved in the fun. However, Dipper has a particularly bad attitude about this. And... I wish so much that Dipper made his own friends. Like, are there no boys his own age in town? I feel like there has to be an episode where they address this because what he keeps trying to do is hang out with Wendy and be friends with Wendy's friends. But he is just too young to fit in with them. He needs to find somebody. But he's like a loner and while it's not like Mabel doesn't miss him right back, like later on, like at the end of the episode, what it comes down to is that they each miss and care about one another. But he can't like constantly expect Mabel to be the only source of a an outside relationship and a friendship in his life. He needs to meet some people. He needs to make an effort. Um but anyway, I'm getting ahead of myself here. So, yeah, the the girls are all doing their um their what do you call it? screaming, I guess. Their their sleepover shrieking when we see Dipper off in the corner pulling the pillow over his head with his eyes like they're bloodshot. He's trying to sleep, but he can't. And Grenda, every time she gets excited about anything, she begins chanting and pounding on the floor. 
And finally, this is when Dipper has to draw the line and be like, can you just do this somewhere else? And honestly, it is sort of surprising that if you have a sleepover, that you're having it in the same bedroom where you both sleep. Like for me, when I had a sleepover with multiple friends, if it was just one friend, it would be in my room and they would sleep on the floor. But or they would share my bed depending because there was like a time when I had a slightly bigger bed. But otherwise, if we had more than one friend, they would sleep in the living room. We would all be together on the floor in sleeping bags in the living room. And it's so funny to think back now, like how much, how excited I would get to be able to use a sleeping bag. Like I now would consider that just a terrible fate. But as a kid, it's so exciting. It's just like, it's the best. And you you don't want to be the loser sleeping in a bed while your friends are all getting to use sleeping bags. Like, that sucks. But as a grown up, you're like, will they be mad if I take the bed? Uh, let me just have the bed, please. Um, so Dipper is trying to like separate himself from this. And he winds up like sleeping out in the woods. And there's a literal wolf like gnawing on his leg and he looks at the wolf and then he looks at the window and sees the girls screeching and jumping around and says this is still better and tries to like lay down and just endure it and then we cut to the next morning (laughs) you guys this is the funniest weirdest thing there is so much happening in this scene So first of all, there's a pizza box. It's open. There's a goat. He's eating the pizza. Mabel's bangs are standing straight up in the air. And somebody has written party girl over her forehead. She opens her eyes and sits up. And her Asian friend, that small one, is, is literally taped to the wall. The other one comes out of the closet covered in kiss marks and says, I don't know what I was kissing in there, but I have no regrets. And there is just a series of things in the room there. They made like a little, um, a little fort with a broom handle and a blanket. The place is fucking trash. One of the uh, teddy bears has an also taped to the wall so all they really went to town and dipper comes in and is like very angry he it looks like shit he slept in the woods he's got twigs coming out of his hair his eyes have like circles under them he says something about how last night an owl tried to eat my tongue to which mabel says that's great like she thinks that this is a really fun story and he's like no that is not great i can't live with this and she says what i'm delightful to live with get ready to be poked by the fun stick boop and she has a literal stick that she just like pokes him with um and it turns out that grenda went around and broke all of the stuff that they built to make their little uh, putt putt course and this is pretty much what sends Dipper right over the edge and he is like we need to make some rules about how we're going to like cohabitate in this room together without killing each other and one of the first rules has to be no sleepovers and she's like I don't complain about you keeping me up with your summer reading and he says how does reading keep you awake and then we get this wonderful moment. Dipper is reading a book called The Case of the Caper Case Caper by with the Sibling Brothers by Jenkins W. Jenkins. And he's reading it with a light on, whispering. <gasps> oh! <laughs> Interesting. But who stole the capers and then clicks his pen like 15 times and then we see mabel with the pillow over her head growling to herself um 
And he says, at least my braces don't whistle when I breathe. And he says, washing clothes, because she says, at least I wash my clothes once in a while. And he says, washing clothes is a waste of time. I'm a busy guy. And this leads to them deciding that they cannot share a room anymore. And they don't know what they're going to do because there's only their bedroom and Stan's bedroom. And Stan says something like, what do you think that there's like a secret room in this house? Now, I would like to call all of y'all's attention back to the end of, I believe, episode one, in which Stan opens a mysterious room behind the, uh, what do you call it, vending machine. He opens a door and slips in there, and we do not ever hear about that again. So he is lying. There definitely is another room. But we find yet another that Seuss has just discovered. So this room is real creepy. Um, it's like loaded with dust. It's pretty big. And both Dipper and Mabel want to move in here. They are both very, very excited about it. And they just decide. And, and there's I, I don't know if this is significant, but I'm going to mention it because of the way Dipper stops and stares. But there is a 1982 calendar on the wall with the 4th of July circled on the calendar. So again, I don't know if this means anything, if this is important in any way, but I just wanted to mention it to remind myself and the audience in case. And uh, what begins to happen is that both Dipper and Mabel want this room because it's big and it's already got like furniture in it and stuff. And Stan decides that the person who gets to have the room is the one that is able to suck up to him the most successfully. And at this point, Dipper has decided that there is no goddamn way Mabel is getting this room. Now, full disclosure, I believe Dipper should be the one to get this room. Here is why. And I talked about this in an episode of Crazy Ex-Girlfriend as well. Some houses are good party houses. Good party houses are houses that have a, an area that you can stick noisy people and events and the rest of the house does not have to be subjected to it the way that they would if they were in the very next room. Now, obviously, the Mystery Shack isn't a great party house, although we did have that dance that he tried to throw, which seemed pretty good, but nevertheless. Um, but they do have the attic. And while that's not necessarily a good party room for the sleepovers that Mabel wants to continue having, I can't really think of a better place to stick a bunch of noisy kids than a basement or an attic. And if she wants to keep on having these gatherings, which she would, that's like half the point of what's going on here. That is what they should do is keep her upstairs and Dipper can be down here because he's much quieter and doesn't have friends over nearly as often. And it's not like this room is necessarily bigger that we can see than the room that they are in now. So it's not like she's going to wind up with uh, like less space or anything. So the two of them begin to, um, you know, compete against one another. And it's very clear that Mabel is just better at sucking up to Stan than Dipper is. She just some for some reason knows precisely what this guy wants and is able to give it to him. And she is sort of taunting Dipper as he walks around in this room. And he is shuffling on the carpet that uh, says experiment 78, I think, if I'm not mistaken, on a tag attached to it. And he's shuffling around trying to work up some static electricity so that he can shake on an agreement with him and Mabel and give her a, like a spark. He's just trying to like play a little mini prank on her. Right. But when he touches her, 
their consciousnesses switch bodies. And the two of them have a shockingly realistic reaction for a cartoon. Mabel in Dipper's body begins punching herself in the stomach, shouting, get out, get out. And Dipper in Mabel's body sits curled up in the corner, chanting, this isn't happening. This isn't happening. This isn't happening. And this feels like what you would do. This just seems fair. Um, now they quickly figure out exactly how they can switch back, but each of them has a reason not to do that. So the first thing that Dipper wants to do is he realizes that if he's in Mabel's body and she's been like doing better than him sucking up to Stan, Stan, who is literally keeping score, can be tricked. Oh my God. For some reason, Siri heard me. Um, he can be tricked into thinking that he's uh, taking points away from Mabel. Now, I would like to point out that the two of them still seem to retain their own voices. So really, there should be a moment of Grunkle Stan, like, noticing that they each sound like each other. But for the sake of the show, I'm going to assume that they sound the same to other people's ears and that the viewers get to hear their own voices because we need to know exactly who's in what body. And so Grunkle Stan cannot tell. And Dipper in Mabel's body begins to insult him and like ruin things and break stuff just to get Mabel's points taken away and eventually succeeds in getting himself the key to the room, except for the fact that it's really Mabel that gets given the key because she's the one in his body. So then, of course, he wants to switch back. And that's when Mabel's like, oh, wait, no, all I have to do is not switch back with you. And I get to keep this key. So this goes back and forth for quite a bit. Meanwhile, Seuss is in the room when Waddles is rubbing around on that same carpet and bends over to pet Waddles as he's saying to himself, that he wishes he could be a pig because it looks like Waddles has a pretty sweet life. And they wind up getting switched and Waddles winds up in Seuss's body. Doesn't even barely know how to walk around because it's two legs is like just standing around, like staring at stuff with his like weird cross eyes and eating objects and generally like, causing mayhem at one point wendy comes in and she sees seuss with his like crazy eyes chewing on the carpet and it's just like you know what buddy i'm just gonna come back later and there's this weird subplot where a woman who is looking for directions comes in and the the waddles seuss runs out the door because he just sees that the door is open and he's very excited about it and she says, oh, you'll show me the way? Such a gentleman. And she chases after him. And then later on in the episode, she comes back after Seuss is in his own body again and tells her that, yes, I will marry you, which I am fucking dying to know what happened to make her think that that was on the table. And then the end of the episode is like after credits is her talking about how she doesn't think she can do this anymore because Seuss just seems so different all of a sudden, which, uh, does he, does he, but yeah, like this, this woman needs to raise her standards because she was about to marry a little literal pig in a man's body. Um, now Mabel who is trying to enjoy the fact that she is the one that's getting this room gets a little bit sort of uh, thwarted by Dipper having a pretty good idea. So he in Mabel's body invites her friends over and has a slumber party so that she has is like feeling distinctly on the outside of things and wants to go back to her old body so that she can have fun with her friends again. And she's listening at the door in Dipper's body. And this is when Stan comes trundling along and is like, oh, so you're at that creepy age where you like to watch girls, huh? And 
drags Mabel, Mabel Dipper off to talk to her about her changing body. It all begins with this little fella, the pituitary gland. He may be little, but he has big plans. And she cannot handle it. it. This is so funny to me. I love this. It's so creepy. So what winds up happening is Seuss goes out and waddles his body and old man McGuckin sees him and decides that he wants to chase him down and make him into bacon. And eventually Seuss comes running home and Seuss is like just in time for the uh, girls from the slumber party to also wander into the room with the magical carpet. All of them switch bodies. Old man McGuckin comes in. He switches bodies. And eventually the two cops come in and also begin switching bodies with everybody. And it's it's a pretty fun scene. Um, oh, and I forgot to mention baby fights, which is a thing that like Uncle Stan is watching. He keeps like, it, God, I hope baby fights comes back. I really hope that this is like a recurring joke because I find this so funny. There's at one point when one of the babies is just going like, blah, 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 and the subtitle says, I'm not here to make friends. <laughs> um, so yeah, lots of body switching and going back and forth. And then finally, everybody else leaves and Mabel and Dipper are alone fighting over the key. And she, he asks her, why do you even want the key so bad? And she says, well, I didn't want to move out. And he's like, well, me neither. And they both stop and look at each other. And he says, I never wanted to move out. And he tells her, I never wanted to, but I was having a lot of fun with you. And now you're bringing your friends over like every night. And, you know, I I know you like Candy and Grenda. That's Candy's name. I forgot about it. Um, but I'm, I'm kind of just, you know, left behind. And he, it's a weird moment because it's like, I like that she doesn't apologize to him exactly because she gets to have friends. This is okay. But I do wish like, you know, if she's bringing her friends over every night, you can make it like a sometimes thing. It doesn't have to be an every night thing. Um, and he says something about how she probably doesn't know what he's going through. And she says, you're probably feeling really awkward and sweaty, huh? And he says, yeah, how'd you know? And she gives him the key and tells him that she won't fight him for it. So this ends with the two of them setting up their own spaces in their own rooms. And they each seem pretty happy as they're getting into bed. But then Dipper turns to say goodnight to her and she's not there. And she turns to say goodnight to him and he's not there. And they both look really sad about it. And then all of a sudden, he knocks on her bedroom door and says, Hey, um, do you want to have a sleepover? And they start playing golf again in the room. And again, hit Stan in the head with a golf ball. I really, really enjoy the the whole like turn that this takes they wind up not actually staying separate because later on she asks um dipper what they're gonna do with that extra room and he's like oh i gave it to seuss so that he could make it into like a proper break room and this is when we cut to him talking to this woman um melanie says what did you think about grunkle stan's reason to give mabel and dipper's body the key because dipper stood up for himself you had me at shut up old man i forgot about that Thank you, Melanie, for bringing that up. Yeah, that like it was a really it was a really great moment. Honestly, I really there are times where it's like that. I know that I can be this way and I don't even quite realize it until it happens. But like I'm a very forceful person and a lot of guys will let you be forceful when 
they want to sleep with you because they're just like, I'll just be agreeable and say yes to whatever because I just want to get in your pants and I think it's more likely that this will work out if I go along with what you say. And anytime I ran across a guy who sort of like called me out on stuff, I would sit up and pay attention because it felt like he was interested in more than just trying to get laid. And that was part of my attraction to Owen was like, when we first started dating, he would immediately just be like, hey, I don't, the way that you said that was really not okay. And he would just, you know, say shit. And I like appreciated it. You don't find people who are able to like stand up to you in a way that feels sincere and like righteous all the time. So I really feel Grunkle Stan on that. And I kind of want Mabel to tell Dipper that she did this and like let him know that Grunkle Stan reacted this way. But it might come up again. We'll see. Um, all right. I'm out of time. So I got to wrap up. But thank you again to Melanie for commissioning these. These were some really fun ones. I hope that you guys all enjoyed the episode. And hopefully I'll be seeing you soon with a new one, I think, in a couple weeks. So until then, toodaloo, motherfuckers. Spoiled Network Podcast.